Okay, your camera's here. Thank you. So it's got to get it to recognize me. So I'll do the process we're working. Yep. I can rub out with you in the back as well. Ah, that's good. That's good. Thank good. you. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Oh. Oh, it just makes sense for us to our unit does like 80 percent of the student work in the first year yes yes also like 100 percent of our lecture yes and then everybody uses education resources we still have the same amount of them. and our team just slightly over the um, by you uh, research guys so you guys need people yeah because we've got an executive today yeah and have you talked to peter or Good. Thank you very much. Okay, microphone is on. Everything is good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Today I want to get onto the whole idea of a heat engine and push towards Carnot's theorem, which I'm not going to make. First, I want to finish off stuff from magnetic systems. So magnetic systems are unfortunately complicated. But as you'll see, they get us some fun toy systems that are useful. So from last lecture. We had two expressions for work done on a magnetic material. On, just to keep it confusing, magnetic material. Oops. Uh. And it all depends on how you define the energy. Okay, so this is important. So we have one uh, magnetic material. Plus mutual field. And in this case, we get the work on system is equal to V, B, B, M. And the second one we got was just magnetic material only. So you just have a magnetic material, nothing else happening magically. It's, um, you're doing work on it. So the work on the system is equal to minus V M D B. So the trouble with this is both of these are correct. Okay. It depends on the circumstances, i.e. whether you need to include the uh, mutual field. So if your material is inside a solenoid, hello camera, you recognize me. Yeah. If the material is in a solenoid, then you cannot avoid the mutual field interaction because it's there. But if instead I've got a magnetic material here and I've got a humongous permanent magnet over there, and this is so small it makes no difference to the permanent magnet, and I slowly bring it towards the permanent magnet, I use the second formula because I don't have to worry about any um, mutual field. Okay, so they're both correct. 
It will depend on the circumstances. Okay, any questions on that? I'm not going to use these formulae particularly. Um, I don't know if Julian will or will not, but I will make a toy system for counting states. So we'll use this quite a bit. Whoops, it's that way. Oh, okay, I'm going to do a direct calculation. Calculation of self energy of this same paramagnetic system. Uh, okay, do a direct calculation. So what I have is a potential energy of magnetic moment. You, okay, my little tiny uh, magnet. So if I have that, the energy, I'm gonna call it U, is just equal to minus the magnetic dipole times the B field. So in physics, the B field is the important guy. But this is at the level of a single dipole. Okay, but I want macroscopic. So macroscopically, I can write that energy dagger is same as U dagger. And the component coming from these dipoles is just going to be given by minus V big M dot B. So, and I can also write that as minus big and curly M, B. So what do I have here? I've got uh, where? Um, big curly M equals my total magnetic moment. So it's all the little spins in the volume. You add them all up. And so this is explicitly extensive, okay? Whereas this guy, M is equal to magnetic moment per unit volume. Okay, so we'll have done a switch to macroscopic there. Okay, I want to do a couple of things. I've got an example in the notes. I think I'm going to leave it for you guys to look at yourselves and talk to the tutor if it's problematic. So example. Um, Calculate delta U and, sorry, get rid of that, and Q from initial to final for paramagnet. So what I'm going to say is do this, do for homework, C notes. Okay. So I don't really want to deal with that. Um, it's fairly straightforward, but you've got to get your head around things. Okay. What I do want to talk about is thermodynamic processes for magnetic systems, for paramagnetic materials.
Okay. Oh, what are you doing? So we've only got one state equation. I want to use it. We've also got an energy equation. So we have everything we need. The trouble with the energy is it's complicated. So if I have an isothermal magnetization or demagnetization, okay? I can go either way, but isothermally. So this is process one. So what do I know about this system? It's a magnet. So I've got temperature, oops, equals a constant. I've got my equation of state, which is Curie's law. So I can write that as M equals C over temperature, which in this case is constant, times H, okay? So this is my equation for isothermal magnetization. And what can I say about it? It's linear and intercept equals zero. So I want to draw this on a new kind of graph. Let me get it right, so I don't muck it up. I want to draw this on a magnetization H diagram. This is what people in this game do. Okay, so I've got magnetization this way, and I've got H that way. So Curry's law just says that I've got a bunch of lines. Um, there, there, and there, okay? Which one is the hot one? These are isotherms. The, which one? Bottom one, okay? So this is T goes up, increases. And these are isotherms. Okay, so different system. So I've got low, low T, medium T, and hot. Okay, so they're going down. That's weird. So straight away, this is different from an ideal gas. The next game I play. So temperature is connected to magnetism. So I guess we kind of knew that. So the next one is two. Magnetic heating slash cooling at constant H. Okay, again, if you're an experimental magnetism person, you control H, you don't control B, because that's the knob you have to turn your electromagnet up or down. So we're at constant H. So I can, again, I've only got that one equation of state. So I say magnetization equals C H, which is constant, times one over temperature, okay? So this basically is telling me that if I want the temperature to go up, then this corresponds to magnetization going down. Okay, it's an inverse relationship. So again, I plot that on my curve, on my space. I can say that Diagram is magnetization H, and I'm sitting at constant H, 
and going there. So this is T low, T high. Okay. And this is H equals constant. So we can heat and cool. We can um, move up and down the system at uh, constant isothermally. The last process we need is adiabatic. Okay, so let's deal with that. Third process is adiabatic. So number three, adiabatic magnetization DMAG. Okay. This is more complicated. So I need to use ideas of thermodynamics to unravel this. So my energy for the magnetic material alone. Isolated mag material. I mean paramag. Okay. So that's all I'm dealing with. So we just had that at the start of this lecture, U dagger is equal to minus V M dot V. Okay. The total magnetization, the volume times the magnetization, the unit volume times the B field. So from that, I just get the change in energy is going to be equal to uh, my, oh, sorry, look at that, minus mu naught, the volume, and again, I switch to the variables that the experimentalists use, M final, H final, minus magnetization initial, H initial. Nothing special there, all that one. Okay, but look at the first law. So the next thing I do is look at first law. I can write that as du dagger is equal to dq minus the work. So in this case, I'm gonna do the work reversibly and it's gonna be vm db because I've got this isolated magnet here. Okay, but what am I dealing with? Adiabatic process. Okay, so that means that that guy is equal to zero, okay? Because it's adiabatic. So I now have an expression for du that guy, and I can integrate it. So let me do that. So I have D bar U dagger is equal to minus V M D B. And I can apply Curie's law. So first I convert that to minus mu naught V M D H and then I apply Curie is equal to minus mu naught V times Curie's constant H D H on T. So I can integrate that. Okay, so I'm gonna get that the change in the internal energy is minus mu naught VC integral H initial H final of H the H on T. Okay, that's my second equation. Okay. I've got these two equations. Are they going to give me the same result? 
What's going to happen if I try and integrate that? It's going to scale differently. So something is funny about it. I'm going to end up with H squareds out of that and terms that have to do with temperature. So something has to simplify this to make those two equations consistent. Okay, so to make one and two consistent, basically what I need is that M is equal to C on H T must be constant. or adiabat. Okay, it's not obvious why this should be the case, but to make those two equations consistent, I need this result. So what this implies is that H final over H initial, sorry, no, 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 no. over T final equals H initial over T initial equals M, which is equal to a constant or an adiabat. Okay, that's the important result I want to get from that. That if you've got an adiabatic process, the magnetization is constant. So again, I go back to my diagram. Always draw pictures. I've got H, which I control, M, which I observe, and I'm on adiabat. That's my adiabat. Okay. So this guy out here is hot. This guy over here is cold. Okay, because H divided by T is constant, and it's my constant magnetization. Okay, so we've got three types of processes. We've got um, isothermal processes, we've got constant H processes, and we've got adiabats. I can then make a cycle. So make a cycle an MH cycle. So instead of PV space, I'm in HM space. So let's start with, start with an isotherm, nice and easy. So it goes through zero, remember that. So there is A, to B, and this is isothermal. Okay. And it's an isothermal magnetization. And then I run it through an adiabatic process. Adiabatic DMAG. They call it DMAG, but is the magnetization changing? No. Okay. That's the language they use. I will use it. Silly, but that's how it is. Physicists, I think, were very confused by magnets for a long time. And as you've probably noticed in your electromagnetism courses, you've probably never covered a bar magnet, okay? Any idea why? Horribly complicated, okay? So this is constant. And so this is, what did I call it? I called it uh, constant H. Uh, yeah, cooling, okay? So magnetic cooling, a constant H, 
lower the temperature, uh, increase the temperature. So it's heating. Constant H and I'm heating. Okay, so I've got an adiabatic process. No heat goes into that. I've got an isothermal magnetization. So the temperatures are remaining fixed, but I'm actually losing heat. So Q goes out to maintain that. And this guy is a heating process. So it's doing no work. I've got to add heat in. And this one's adiabatic. Q equals zero. Okay. So this is my simple magnetic cycle. Okay. These things are used. Magnetic cooling is actually an experimental tool used at low temperature in low temperature physics. There's lots of people doing that in this building, um, but not me. Okay. So you should know about it. Any questions on any of that? So I'm going to leave the reality of magnets and later come back with my toy system, which is just a spin system which I understand a lot better because it's simple, it's a toy. So this is lecture eight proper. So we're still running behind by now only half a lecture. So things are going well. So heat engines. Okay, the last one I just showed you is a magnetic version of a heat engine. It is a heat engine. Okay, so this is the early development of thermodynamics. People realized that heat, when you heated something up, you increased the energy. So what was the idea? The target of industrial revolution was so idea. I want to convert heat to work. Okay, there's all this energy lying in this bench here. Can I somehow suck it out of it? Okay. Um, so that's the idea. That's what I want to do. And normally I want a cyclic process. Because I can go round and round and round. Okay, so for a cyclic process, the change in internal energy for a cycle equals zero since it's a state parameter. Okay, so I apply the first law. Okay, which is du equals d bar q minus d bar w. So this gives me that the net heat for a cycle is equal to the net work for a cycle. So a cycle is a way of switching heat and work. So, and it's cyclic, so I keep running it again and again and again. So this is looking like a good start. Okay, first ideas. Reheat engine. As the camera has lost me, can you find me again? No, you don't like me. Uh, yes, you do. Okay. Rather than starting with extracting work from heat, I'll do the opposite a heating machine. Call it a heater even, not quite a heater, but I'll call it that. So some kind of a heater is the following. I've got some contraption, M. I do some work on the contraption using electricity, using a pedal, using something. And somehow this transfers energy, heat, to a heat reservoir. Okay, so that looks pretty simple. And this is my heating machine. 
machine or oops or working substance okay there it is so can you make such a thing something that just converts work into heat yes examples mixing dragging my feet on the carpet there's so many examples so easy to make so mixing dragging feet on the carpet etc these are simple and you basically get work converted to heat, okay? No problems with that. First law is happy. Okay, now let's try and turn it around. So example number two is machine to convert heat to work. Okay, so what I'd really like is T, that's my heat reservoir, and I want heat to go down, some kind of a machine, M, and then spit out work. Okay, so first, does not violate the first law. Okay. It's completely happy with the first law. So basically, I get Q cycle equals W cycle since delta U cycle is equal to zero because the state parameter. Okay. Can you design a system to do this? Win infinite amounts of money. Yeah. I don't think you can do it. I think you're going to have trouble. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to extract it or it's not going to... Basically, this is not going to work, okay? You are effectively inventing a perpetual motion machine or actually worse. All the heating machines we had, which were just running the other way, all involved dissipative work. So to run a heating machine backwards, which is work to heat, nothing else happens, you need dissipation. And because you need dissipation, you cannot run it backwards. It's the dissipation that is the problem. So all heating machines involve dissipation. Okay, therefore, not reversible. Okay, it's the dissipation that is the trouble. So what we'll get to later is that this violates second law later. Okay, yeah. Yes, you can't convert heat energy to directed work. Okay, it's been randomized, it's been scrambled. You're basically unscrambling the egg. It's not gonna happen. So we can't do that. Very bad. If we could do that, you could make tons of money, but it's not gonna happen. 
Okay, so you can't make something that's perfect. Search for a reversible heat engine. So the heat to work machine, the perfect one, the non-existent one, converted all the heat to work. You can't do that. So let's at least try and make it reversible so it can go forwards and backwards. So what do I need to do? I need to make it a little bit more complicated. I've got a hot bath. I've got a cold bath. And I've got my machine. And I've got heat flowing in. I've got heat flowing out. And the system actually does work. Okay, so this is a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. Okay, so I've made it more complicated, but you got to try something and see if you can make it work. So I apply first law. So I know that delta U cycle is equal to zero. So I can therefore get that Q cycle equals W cycle. So I can write that as the net work out. I don't need these absolute brackets, but they just make my argument cleaner, is equal to Q in, the amount of heat that goes in, minus the heat that I lose. So I lose energy by heat leaking out, okay? So using all this, I can define an efficiency. This gives me efficiency. which is basically efficiency is what do I get and how much does it cost? So what I get is work out and what it costs is the amount of heat that I input, okay? So if I expand out this, I get that I can write the efficiency is equal to or defined as this symbol eta. And it's equal to one minus the heat that goes out divided by the heat that goes in. Okay, so this is a very important equation. And this is, uh, sorry, less than one. Okay. Okay. So the only thing, way to make this perfectly efficient is if the heat that escapes out of my system is zero, okay? And as we will see, you can't do that. Any questions on that? Yeah. You can do that. you'd have to have that bottom bath at absolute zero. Okay, so if the bottom bath, we'll get to it. The, the heat out has to get to absolute, it has to do with absolute zero, but no, you can't. Cascade is not gonna get you there. Okay, so this, there's some problems. Okay, so we've got this. Let's find the cycle with maximum efficiency and we're gonna use sophisticated methods. Okay, so, whoops. What cycle has max efficiency? When 
transferring heat between hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. So I've asked a sophisticated question. It's couched in a lot of things. So I'm saying it's going to be maximally efficient, but it only has two reservoirs. Only two heat reservoirs. Okay. How am I going to find this? What method would you use to find the cycle that has maximum efficiency operating between two valves? Any ideas? You have no tools at all, so what would you do? Yes, okay. As far as I can tell, the method to discover this was guess. And the guesser was Sadi Arno. Oops. Around eighteen twenty four. He made a colossal guess. Okay, let's try the guessing process. See if we can guess as good as Sadi, although we know the answer. You've got two heat baths and you want to transfer heat from those two heat baths to your working substance. What would you use for two of those processes? The processes that transfer the heat. You've got a hot bath, a temperature hot, a cold bath, a temperature cold. What kind of a process do you think might give you efficient transfer? I.e. work for heat. You've only got adiabatic has no heat transfer, so that one's a loser. Isothermal, okay. Isothermal is the one because the temperature is fixed. So guess one is use two isothermal processes. So one at T hot and one at T cold. So let's draw the PV diagram. So I've got pressure, volume, and these are going to be hyperbolas. So I'm going to have hot. That's my T hot. And I'm going to have my T cold. These are my isotherms. Okay, so I'm going to be sucking heat out at T hot, spitting it out at T cold. I need a cycle. Those two lines never cross each other because they're two different temperatures. So I don't have a cycle. I need to join them up. How do I join them? Yeah. Now use your adiabat because you want no heat loss. Okay. So this is why the guess was maybe not such a bad guess. So two is join these with adiabats. So isotherms, you get pressure going as one on volume. And for an adiabat, you get pressure going as one on volume to the gamma. So they're steeper, okay? So my two adiabats are going to be, well, this is a terrible drawing. This is not what an adiabat looks like. But they look like this in textbooks, okay? They don't really look like that. There's my two adiabats. Okay, so I've got my process. So I'm going to go down the slippery dip, converting heat to work. I'm going to slide down this, doing a little bit more work, but no heat involved. I'm going to crank up there, 
sucking, uh, spitting heat out and doing negative work. I'm going to run up there doing negative work. That's my cycle. Okay. I'm saying this does not look like a real Carnot cycle, even though textbooks draw them like that and my notes draw them like that. You guys all have computers. You all have plotting packages. You all have access to Mathematica, Maple, MATLAB, whatever you like. Plot real adiabats, plot real isotherms. See what this looks like. What you'll discover is that when you start playing with it, you're gonna end up with a little squashed, funny little shape. But that's the reality, okay? Not this fake stuff, okay? So be careful. I hate cartoons that mislead you. This misleads me and I've got a big fat square um, or trapezoidal volume. I don't really have that, okay? So I'd like you all to plot this for yourselves using a package. Okay, so this is called the Carnot cycle. Okay, and if I'm going to have this machine, I need to assume I've got some kind of a substance. So uh, let's go back, let's do a couple more things on that. So what happens? Heat goes in. Heat goes out. And on the adiabats, PQ equals zero. Okay. So I need a machine. Assume machine equals a piston build with, you only know one thing, ideal gas. Okay, that's all we know. So we've got equations of state, PV equals NKT, and we've got U equals one over gamma minus one NKT. Okay, so any old ideal gas, I'm not picking anything in particular. And for the adiabat, uh, adiabat, I can write that P V gamma equals a constant. That's all I know about my ideal gas. Okay, so I want to calculate efficiency. So eta is equal to one minus Q out over Q in, okay? So I need to be able to calculate Q out and Q in. So I need to calculate those two things. So first, Q in. Okay, so it's an isothermal expansion. We've done this before. And it's at temperature hot. Okay, that's what I've got. So what do I need? I've got energy is equal to one over gamma minus one NKT. So something that might be a bit of a surprise is that for an isotherm, delta U isotherm is equal to zero. For an ideal gas, keep the temperature fixed. Basically, the energy stays fixed on the isotherm. So this implies that by first law, what I have is that E bar Q, the heat going into my isotherm has to be equal to PDV because change in energy is zero. So this gives me that Q in is equal to the integral from got DNA. That means I must have put DNA on my diagram. Let's go backwards, sorry. I put some labels there. A, B, C, D. 
So I'm going down this isotherm from D to A. So I'm integrating from D to A, D D V. And this gives me N K T hot V D, uh, sorry, V A. over VD, okay? And that has to be positive, okay? I know that, yeah. Ah, 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 ah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a logarithm there. Yeah, that's why it's positive. Okay, so that's my heat in. Heat out is also on an isotherm. So similarly, Q out is equal to NKT low. Logarithm, natural logarithm of VC over VB. And this guy is going to be negative. Okay? So it all makes sense. So I've got heat in, I've got heat out. Calculations are easy. I can get Carnot efficiency. Just stick those into the equation and I get eta is equal to one minus Q out over Q in, which is equal to one minus N K T cold logarithm volume B over volume C. So basically I've taken the absolute value sign, so I've made this positive. Because I've got absolute value signs divided by N K T hot logarithm of VA over VD. Ugly. So when you got an ugly equation, try and simplify it. Okay, so they're gonna vanish, okay? So the trouble is these guys, okay? So, and what I notice is that A and B are on an adiabat. Okay, because they're on an adiabat, I can write that pressure A, volume A to the gamma is equal to pressure B, volume B, to the gamma. Hello, can you hear me? And using that, I can extract that NKT hot VA to the gamma minus one is equal to NKT cold. They're on different isotherms, VB to the gamma minus one, okay? But if I get that guy, I also then get for um, C and D, I get the same equation, NK T hot VD gamma minus one is equal to NK T cold VC gamma minus one. Okay. These equations are very similar. Okay. So from those two equations, I can basically divide them, okay? So if I divide those two equations, and this gives me VA on VD is equal to VB on VC. And bingo, that term disappears. So because of that, this term disappears. Okay, so this is where the magic has happened. 
This means that the efficiency or Carnot cycle eta equals one minus T cold over T hot. That is absolutely magic. So Carnot cycle, and it's true for ideal gas. Yeah, question from the chat guy. If Q is negative and Q is positive, then don't you need to add zero? Uh, no. Yeah, you figured it out. Good. Fine. Yeah. No, they're just you're just divi dividing them out. They're just this log VB on VC is exactly the same as log VA on VD because VB on VC is exactly the same as VD A on VD. Okay, they're exactly the same. One more piece of magic and then I quit. But Q out over Q in is the same as, whoops, TC over TH. Because I just put them back into the formula from whence I came. And this gives me that Q out over T cold is equal to minus Q in over T hot. So for cycle, delta Q over T cycle is equal to zero. Looks like a state parameter. Okay. So this Carnot engine, we haven't finished with it yet, but it's got some very magical properties. The efficiency, efficiency just depends on the temperature of the two baths. And as well as that, I have what looks like a state parameter has magically popped out of the air, but for this Carnot kind of cycle alone, if you divide the heat by the temperature at which it enters into the system, and then divide the heat by the temperature at which it leaves the system, or the cycle, this equals zero when you add them together. Okay, so it's telling me that there's a state parameter hiding there somewhere that I don't know about. And it's got to do with heat and temperature. You can guess the name of this state parameter, but let's go on a bit more. Okay, so we pick this up on Monday and hopefully catch up with things. Good. So you guys have all seen that the everything is posted now. I think I've still got one audio uh, video missing because it got corrupted, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let me just do this, save myself. Ah, mm. bloody hell. I think I've got an English keyboard again, have I or not? At two. Yeah. Done. Good. Yeah. Okay, I'm happy. I think. Tell me. Yeah. Um, so I just had a question about like, the cycle. Yeah. Because up until now, cycles and yeah. like, the have felt like oh, yeah. they're, they're acting on like, one system. Yes. So, like, here you've got like two good bats. Yes. 
fan system? Or they do? No, no, they're two external. They're external. So I've got a heat engine somehow coupled to a heat bath and another heat bath. Right. So, so like, okay, so I've got I've called it an ideal gas in a piston. So somehow I've got to take that ideal gas in a piston, connect it isothermally to the hot bath, and let it magically expand under load. And then when I finish that process, I wrap it in styrofoam and say, okay, adiabat away, and it expands a little bit more. And then when it's finished adiabatting, I unwrap the styrofoam and connect it to a cold bath. And then it goes, shrinks down. And then I, at some point, stop and say, okay, I wrap it in styrofoam again, adiabat it, shrinks a little bit more. And then I connect again, start the cycle. So it's artificial. It's not real. It's got to go infinitely slowly. It's completely unreal, but that's what it is. Right? Yes, yes, yes. So it's transferring energy from that hot bath over there to the cold bath over there via this intermediary motor that I connect and then connect. Okay, good. Thank you. I think I've done that and emailed it to myself. Ah, I've got to stop the Zoom, don't I? Yeah. Stop share. End.